I do want to mention that this event is being videotaped by MCAT, so it will be shown on Community Access Television as part of MCAT's Media Assistant Grants Program to nonprofit organizations. And we will send out the information on when this will air again if you want to watch it again and make sure you get the information really carefully. UM alumni John and Courtney McKee launched Headframe Spirits in 2010, building a brand celebrating the mining history of their hometown in Butte, Montana. John put his past experience distilling biodiesel to work developing five popular spirits, Never Sweat Bourbon Whiskey, High Ore Vodka, Anselmo Gin, Destroying Angel Whiskey, and Orphan Girl Bourbon Cream Liqueur, named after a historic Butte mine. And there may be more in the lineup that I don't know about, so he can tell you if there are. Headframe has grown faster than its owners ever imagined, and the company's success has allowed the McKees to give back to their community, including a donation to the Montana Folk Festival last summer. And today we'll get to hear the full story of how they achieved their incredible growth. Please join me in welcoming John McKee. I'll get this on in a sec, but thank you for having me. Um, I am a nerd, big time, so I also talk fast. So what I thought I'd do in the beginning is I'd just talk for a couple minutes, just let me talk. And uh, but I really like to do this as a and a I like more when we talk together about what it is you're trying to do, what we did, and how it worked, than me just yammering on up here. Um, but a couple of things: I graduated from U of M in ninety, oh crap, ninety six, with a psychology degree, a bachelor's in psychology. Got uh, another BS in computer science at, Monta at uh, Montana Tech, and I've also got a master's in environmental engineering out of Montana Tech. Um, as a shout out to school, I grew up on a campus. My dad was a professor. He's president of Indiana State University right now. But as a shout out to just all things education, every time I got another degree, my salary went up $35,000 every time I got another degree. And then I opened my business and it went down a whole lot. But we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, we, uh, what I want to do a little bit, because I think with all entrepreneurs, we think we've got something very special. We've got a very flash in the pan kind of thing no one else has ever thought of. And for a large part, that can be very true. But there's also a lot of things, I think, in every industry that once you spend a little time looking at it, you find out there's a bunch of wizard behind the curtain. And I want to share a little bit about booze specifically right now with you about the wizard behind the curtain. And then I'm going to back into like what my company is or what Courtney and I's company are, is and how we work. Okay? But let's take some wizard behind the curtain. You heard of Grey Goose? Okay, Grey Goose is made an ethanol refinery in Minneapolis by Archer Daniels Midland. They send on 99 rail cars to gas stations. It gets blended into fuel and gets put in your gas tank. They send a 100th rail car to Connecticut where it gets proofed down and turned and bottled into Grey Goose. Woodford Reserve bourbon. You've probably heard of Woodford Reserve. It's a relatively high-end bourbon. It's about $49, $52 a bottle. When they go to muddle a batch of bourbon at Woodford, they don't have enough. So they go down the street to Brown Foreman and they buy seven barrels of Old Crow, literally off the bottom of the shelf liquor store junk that you've probably never bought because you didn't think it's worth it. They take those seven barrels back, they mix that with one barrel of Woodford, muddle it together and bottle it and then sell it to you at $49 a bottle. Um, some of the reasons I'm sharing some of this wizard behind the curtain here, oh and here's the other one, this is for most of you that are still in school and don't have a lot of money. If you've got a big party you need to go to and you want to bring something, go buy a bottle of Everclear from the, uh, from the liquor store and add 2.2 times as much water as there is Everclear and you have vodka. And now I'm going to spend a little time as I go through my presentation telling you why these things are. But again, even in all things booze, when you look at hooch, there are more people in the United States that work at Los Alamos that know how to make a nuclear bomb than there are people who know how to make booze legally in the United States. So again, there is this, this capacity to have a lot of the wizard behind the curtain. And this is just hooch. But this is the same in every industry. You know, you get specialists, and the specialists hide what they think is special. But it turns out maybe that's not so much. Um, so a little bit about what Courtney and I did. We did start this business. Um, I was, me and a couple guys invented a way to distill biodiesel at commercial scales. These were 100 million gallon a year refineries, 52 acre sites, project budgets in the 50 to 75 million kind of range, and it was about five of us. And, but we were design build, all right? So we invented it, we did all the piping design, column design, we'd go out and do construction management, turn them on, but then we turned them over. They weren't ours, and the recession hit, and no one wanted us to design or build anything for them anymore because they didn't have any money. So that was it. So I was home one night, 
And my wife asked me in bed one night what the heck I was going to do with myself. And I wanted to stay home, be a stay-at-home dad, take care of the kids, get their lunches ready, do laundry. And she immediately called BS on that. And I said, well, what do I do? She said, well, you know how to distill and you like hooch. And I pretty much got out of bed right there and started working on the business plan. Well, specifically, I started working on the marketing plan, not the business plan. And I'll tell you about why I did that later on. Um, but just generally speaking, when it comes to all things, what I've come to learn in this, this short 16, 18 months that we've been open, the four years we worked on the project, and then about the seven or eight years it was me and the guys doing biodiesel, is that once you learn the ins and outs of the industry you're looking to go into, or the industry you're looking to open a business in, or an industry you already have a business in, um, once you really get into the nuts and bolts of it, there's not a lot of dissimilar dissimilarity between anyone else's industry. There's just the specifics of that industry. And I think that one, I'm going to buy, one of the maxims I'm going to share with you later on is exactly what that is for hooch. Um, so real quick, I just want to go through this. This is sort of my nerd thing, but when I talk about, when I talk about booze and I talk about businesses specifically, I sort of came up with these couple of proverbs we sort of live by at, at Headframe, okay? And this is, again, just from a guy who makes hooch. I don't know anything. We had, um, the original plan was it was going to be Courtney and I for the first 16 months to 12 months. Uh, we were open just now 18 months. We have 23 employees. Our sales were about seven times our original performance and projections. And um, so we've done a lot of, I guess, call it catch up, if you will, now, where we spend a lot of time managing our growth appropriately rather than you know, what we originally thought, which was living hand to mouth. So there's been a very different approach that we've had to take on very quickly. But we basically had these couple, I guess, proverbs that we kept, we held pretty true and pretty dear from the first day. And really one of them was, you got to, and this, I don't know if this goes for everyone, but this really worked for us. You've got to have a motto. And to be honest, this were our family mottos. We have two family mottos, okay? And those mottos are, we just, we ain't afraid of nothing, okay? And all they can do is say no. All right, when we took our business plan out, we went to a CDC, we got a 504 loan guarantee from the Small Business Administration and a 7A loan guarantee from the Small Business Administration. Got those first. We went to eight banks in my hometown and they all turned us down. I had a guaranteed, I had a loan guarantee from, from the Small Business Administration. Eight banks turned us down. But again, we just sort of fell back to it. We found out why they didn't want us, to the best of their, their ability to share with us what was happening. And we figured out, okay, all they can do is say no. It's no big deal. Your dream's not over. Just go find someone else. And what's perfect about this one is that it took us a long time. We kept going into banks and saying, okay, we've got this loan guarantee. We're looking for about half a million dollars, and this is variously broken out in capital expenditures and oper operating expenditures, and this is what we need and why we need it. And they said, great, what are you going to do? We said, well, we're going to open a distillery. And at the time, there were only three distilleries in Montana, four distilleries in Montana. Um, and it was one of those things where they couldn't wrap their head around it. So they said, OK, so what kind of IPA are you going to make? And I said, well, I'm not making IPA. I make whiskey. I don't make beer. Well, show us a business model of someone that's doing that. Well. As you knew and young as it was, there was no numbers on Dun & Bradstreet. There was no th nothing in their other portfolio they could compare us to. And so just every bank we went to said, this is a brilliant marketing plan. This is a brilliant business plan. But they shot us down. And eventually what I came to is I rebranded us. The, la the ninth bank I went to, which they, they approved us within, well, it was at a soccer field. Uh, our kids were playing soccer. We met them, the bank uh, president there, pre-arranged pre to meet there. We sat down in the back of the minivan drank a couple cocktails, and we got the deal right there. But what we did was we told this guy, and, and it's true, we had to rethink what we were doing. Yes, we're opening a distillery, but what we really were opening was a value-added agricultural manufacturing facility. I take a barrel, I take a bushel of grain, I upvalue that by about 19 times by the time it hits a bottle. Okay, so what I did was I stopped going to small banks, I stopped going to local banks, I stopped going to commercial banks, I went to an ag bank. And I said, I have a value-added agricultural manufacturing facility. And I said, well, that's great. We want to finance you. So what are you making? And I said, booze. And I said, OK. So I changed the perspective of what it was. And so it took those eight shoot-downs that basically being told no eight times for me to figure out how to rebrand what the message was. I had the guarantee, OK? Any bank I walked into, if I fell on my face, they're going to get their payout from my 504. 
But what I, they didn't have is they didn't have a way to wrap what I was doing around how they did things. They had a comfortable way to think about what we were doing. And so I went to an ag bank instead and said, hey, I'm a value-added agricultural manufacturing facility, which takes a lot of syllables to get out at once. Um, when I went and did that, all of a sudden things happened because I changed for them what their perspective of my loan was. So again, I think with a, the, the various entrepreneurs that we dig and we have so much fun with, like Sarah Calhoun from Red Ant's Pants, who's just badass, by the way, um, and these various other very successful entrepreneurs, what I f tend to find is that they're very chameleon in their approach in that they know what they want to do, but depending on their target audience, they're saying different things. Even though those things mean the same thing, I went to a bank and I said, I want to open a distillery, and they said, no. I went to another bank and said, I want to open a value-added agricultural manufacturing facility, and they said, hell yeah. By the way, what do you make? And then I told them booze. So there are different ways to keep your, your focus and your dream, with by, but by changing your message appropriate to the, to the client you're talking to. So again, the first thing I think you need is you need some sort of a motto. These were our mottos. Literally, these are our family mottos. Well, there's a third one, which is rub some dirt on it. And that's usually for the kids. When they skin their knees, rub some dirt on it and go back out and play. But really, we ain't afraid of nothing. And all they can do is say no. And if you really hold some, if you find your own personal motto, if you don't already have one, if you find one, these things help when you get shot down the seventh, eighth time on your dream and you've got everything on the line. You've got to remember something to fall back on. So for us, I mean, I could come here and talk to you about good to great and you can only run out of cash once and all, but I thought I'd talk a little bit more about a little bit of the core. The, the next part really is you've got to have some sort of a maxim, some sort of short, short, simple truth. This isn't necessarily about your business, although it was about ours. Remember when I started talking about where Grey Goose came from? It comes from Minneapolis, from an ethanol refinery. Right, you pick up that bottle and they say it's French, you know, it's angel tears made on these French pot stills. It's absolute bullshit. What it really is, is they understood something very early on, and I had to do this too. I thought I was, and initially I was really psyched. I'm gonna open a distillery, I'm gonna make whiskey, I'm gonna be cool and I'm gonna have a lot of new friends. And I do have a lot of new friends, I'm definitely not cool. Um, <laughs> But what I did was, very early on, is that from fuel, I sort of learned one thing too, is that when I was making fuel, my margins were about a penny a gallon, half a penny a gallon. Okay, on a hundred million gallon per year refinery, we were doing about a penny to half a penny. Now, I said, well, gosh, that's crazy, you know, I mean, but we got to play in the market. And so we go out and we made the cleanest fuel in the market. In fact, we entered the market, no one was distilling fuel. In fact, it, it wasn't biodiesel specifically. No one was distilling biodiesel. <laughs> And when we left the industry seven years later, the, ups the downstream blenders, BP, Shell, Exxon, who have to take this fuel into their system, wouldn't accept biodiesel unless it was distilled. Okay, but here's what we got burnt, is that early on when we opened up, we had these great refineries going, we had a lot of projects on the drawing board, and there was this, this awful biodiesel snafu in Minnesota where they basically made junk, sold it as biodiesel, and it just killed a whole bunch of semi-trucks and everything else, and it put a big, big you know, you know, iron spear in the heart of biodiesel for a while, and it took us a long time to get out of that. And so, but the problem also was is that we were making a chemically pure methyl ester, but we were competing in exactly the same market as someone that was making junk in their basement. But as far as the market was concerned, that was both biodiesel, although chemically they weren't really the same thing. So it's the same thing in hooch. I mean, one of the first things we figured out is all we are is a marketing company. We just happen to make hooch. All right, Grey Goose does not make hooch. ADM, Archer's Daniels Midland, makes hooch for Grey Goose. And they send some of it over to Grey Goose, the rest is in the gas stations. And what Grey Goose did instead is said, okay, fine, we're not gonna make the hooch, but we're gonna go out and sell the image. We're gonna sell the brand. So what they have, they understood very quickly, and I think what we tried to do very early on is that, yeah, we dig what we do. I love making whiskey. I love making vodka. It's a, I don't care what your job is, what your job's about to be, mine's more fun. I really love my job. But I also understand the core is that I have a marketing company. All right? When I walk into a brand, when I walk into, say, an account, I'll be in Chicago on, on Monday, Oklahoma City on Tuesday, and LA on Wednesday. And when I walk into an account, I can spend time there. I can make a, a pure, you know, just an honest exchange with a person, build a relationship there, and get our brand on the shelf. Southern Wine and Spirits, a, a marketer for Jim Beam, Jack Daniels, they can come in behind me and say, get head frame off the shelf, and if you don't, I'm pulling Beam, Jack Daniels, and everything out of your bar. So 
yeah, it's cool that I've got a brand that people might want to drink every once in a while, but if you're a, brand, if you're a bar owner and you know that your customers are going to come in and ask for all these other brands, and you could lose all of those just by putting me on the shelf because the other distributor doesn't like me there, then you're going to pull my product off the shelf. And so when we really figured that out, that what we have is a marketing company that just happens to make hooch, we totally changed our approach again. Just, just like when we changed our approach as a value-added agricultural manufacturing facility when we asked for money, when we figured out that what we were doing was marketing ourselves to our customers in one way or another, making them want us regardless of, of what we do as a product, was special. And once we figured that out, that changed a little bit of the perspective. I think you got a lot of people who build the, if I just build it, they will come kind of perspective, and you see that business fail often. So my goal was, well, I don't want to force them to come. I want to make sure they want to be a part of it. So I mean, you take all of the micro distilleries in America, there's 700 right now. You take everything we make put together in a year, Jack Daniels spills more that year and loses it down the drain than we put out in product for sale. So it's not just their marketing budget. They can actually afford to lose more than we can all afford to make and still come out on top. So that's just something when you think about what you're doing, how we did it, is we really changed our maxim became, look, we're just a marketing company that happens to make hooch. Um, lastly, you got to have some sort of a mantra. You got to have something to repeat, right? You got to have something that says, this is what I, this is what I want to do. Well, ours, literally, every morning, Courtney and I roll over where we're actually in the same town together anymore, but we roll over, we look at each other, and the first thing out of our mouths is, don't get cocky. All right, we have had a moderate amount of success as far as businesses go. Based upon our plan versus our actuals, we are in a very strange place as far as businesses go. And one of the things we learned, understood very early on is we've seen these businesses. We've seen people have, have initially seen very high degrees of success, and then all of a sudden you see the Hummer, and you see them eating out every night, and you see the flash, the $300 shoes. These, I think, are used. Um, you see a lot of weird things happen when people find a moderate degree of success. And one of the first things we, one of our mantras now is don't get cocky in that it seems cool. I make hooch, all right? It seems cool. I employ people and give them health insurance. It seems cool. I, make, I build stills. So our stills are unique in the industry. We, we manufacture our stills and sell these to other micro distilleries. Um, and it seems cool. And that can go to your head. That can go to your head really fast. Um, even if you're not making money, even if you're not successful, you can still be cocky. And cocky doesn't necessarily sell the day. It doesn't necessarily get your product out the door. And that's something I think you also want to be thinking about. So when I, again, I, when we go into the Q&A here, I will talk to you about P&Ls. I'll talk to you about good to great. I'll talk whatever the hell you want to talk about. But what I wanted to talk about today just were those three quick things. Build yourself a motto, have a maxim, and get a mantra behind it. Because if you can really understand what it is you do and you repeat it to yourself and you believe in it, then it doesn't matter what you're doing. And I'll be very clear about this. Buy a diesel, I would have been out of that anyway. I might not have been going into hooch. I've got this other thing I've been working on for about 17 years. And the capitalization of that is far beyond anything I'm going to be able to get a bank to do. So right now, a head frame is a step to me to do this next thing. Now it's a groovy step and I really dig it. And we've already told all of our employees that we're selling the company to them in about three and a half years. So stick around or don't, but you're gonna own the company in about three and a half years. And if you want me to keep working there, I will, I'll be happy to. But I'm gonna take about three days a week to work on this other project because this is something I've been working on for a long time. So regardless of your mantra, your maxim, and your motto, you should be able to carry that forward into anything else you're doing. I think I'm not a serial entrepreneur. This, you know, when I was doing Buy a Diesel, it was me and five other guys that we figured out how to do it. We said, let's go do this. We took ourselves public. We did the whole nine, so it was a blast. Um, now I'm doing this thing, just Courtney and I, we're having a blast there too. When I move on to the next thing, I'm sure I'm gonna have a blast, but I can guarantee you that now that I've sort of figured out these, these proverbs for myself, these are things I'm gonna carry forward because they sort of work for me. I'm not saying make yours, don't get cocky. I'm not saying yours, I ain't afraid of nothing to rub some dirt on it. I'm not saying do that, but what I am saying is that if you can find those those precepts for yourself, I think you're going to find yourself set up a little bit more for success than you may have been otherwise. Because if you're continually reevaluating who you are 
and completely reevaluating like your focus and what you want to do, that's great. But there should be some basis to it, some foundation to it that you can build on. So no matter what you're doing, biodiesel, hooch, whatever the thing is I'm doing next, when we look at that, I've always got a core foundation of how I approach it. And I think that you know once you go through the your P&L for the 35th time, that or your pro forma for the 50th time because somebody wanted to see something different, yeah, you get that. But that's always there. You always have that base after that. So if someone comes to you and they say, I need help starting a business, you should be able to whip out that pro forma and say, okay, let's look how to fill in the blanks and then give it to them and let them go fill in those blanks because the foundation should be something you can build off anywhere. And so from us, our proverbs of the maxims, the motto, and the, and the, um, the mantra sort of help us make sure we maintain that foundation regardless of what we're doing. So right now, we started our business uptown. We've got Headframe Spirits. It makes our core brand. We're opening a second distillery right now in Butte, and the only thing it does is co-package. And what co-packaging means, and this is part of our original business plan. It's just now we, we finally get to this. But what co-packaging means is we'll do a custom label for anyone in the world, or we'll do stuff for Jim Beam. They'll ship us their bottles from China. They'll ship us a hooch from Kentucky. We'll package it and be their West Coast distribution. We also manufacture stills at this location, so we sell the stills. So when you look at but the, the three proverbs or three mantras I've got up here, I use those at Distillery 1, which we call Phase 1. I use those at Distillery 2, which we call Phase 2. I use those in our manufacturing arm, and I use those in what's about to happen with our new Phase 3, which will get announced here in a couple weeks. Um, so it doesn't really matter what you're doing so long as what you, what you figure out for yourself is true and you hold to it. Um, that's it. So let's chit-chat. Let's have some fun. I'm more than happy to talk. And I will keep talking, trust me. Um, uh, but are there questions or, or things you guys want to know? Or I'm going to go. Shoot. I would love your card. And I'd love to. Um, I'm developing a yes match. And uh, we would, I really want to have local food. Right on. Right on. Right on. Well, one thing, too, is don't forget you guys have uh, Montgomery here in town, Ryan and Jenny. And they're brilliant. Um, I really like Ryan and Jenny at, at Montgomery Distillery. They're really great people. Um, and that's one of the things you need to learn about really quick, too, at least for us, is that, again, the majors, they spill more than all of us combined, all us micros combined make. Okay, so I'm not competing against Ryan and Jenny at Montgomery. In fact, when we have issues, we call each other and ask how to fix them. And when I'm out in the market, if they don't want my vodka, I immediately say, hey, have you heard about Ryan and Jenny over Montgomery? Try, the, try their vodka. You know, because maybe that's more your style. Because what we're out there doing is we're competing against Maker's Mark. We're competing against Grey, Grey Goose. And we're competing against marketing budgets that are insane. Right? I mean, you might think that your booze is expensive, but I guarantee you the price of cost per book, per good, blah, cost of goods sold per bottle of a good bottle of Grey Goose is about $3.28. That includes the glass. That includes the glass. They're selling it to you, they're selling it to you at a plus 40 price point. So they're using a lot of that delta in there to establish a marketing presence that just small businesses can't play. I cannot play this game, and I don't try. So yeah, so anyway, just to that note, you know, Ryan and Jenny are awesome. Go drink their booze, please. Um, can you talk to us about your market penetration? So where did you start? How have you expanded? What are your thoughts about how you're going to grow? Sure. Um, this is, it's interesting, when we started, we did a couple different things. The nice thing about booze in Montana, and this should be very similar across certain industries, is there's usually data available to tell you where to sell. So let's throw out some stuff here. I did build a marketing plan before I built a business plan. I had to figure out what I could sell, where I could sell, and at what price point, and then that told me how big of a building I could buy, how much I could spend on equipment, and how much I'd have to charge. So. The first thing I did was I went to the state of Montana. We're a, closed, we're a closed state, which means all booze has to go through the state. Well, that means, that, of course, that all the data is public. So I know exactly how many bottles of Pendleton and Grey Goose and Jack Daniels have sold in the state. I know for how much. I know in what liquor stores. So for instance, there's over 170 liquor stores in the state of Montana. The top 10 liquor stores sell 30% of all the booze in the state of Montana. So 30% of the market is in 10 stores. Two of them are here in Missoula. You got Crisco and you got Gri and Grizzly. Six of them in uh, No, actually, we don't even break the top ten, surprisingly, and we're, but we're pretty proud of where we make it. Um, all that being said, the um, first thing I did was I went and grabbed that data. 
And I took a look at that data and said, okay, well, if I'm going to play in the state, um, and this is a state I wanted to play in, if I'm going to play in the state, then should I be concentrating on Weibo or should I, in its liquor store, or should I be concentrating on something else? And, I, and once I figured out that these top 10 sell, you know, 10% or 30% of all the booze, the top three, Crisco, Grizzly, and Belgrade Liquor, down in Belgrade, they sell 10% of all the booze in, in the state. Three stores. Okay, so you know what I did? Before I even had a business that was financed, I started working on the label and the bottle design, and I started taking that to the owners of the liquor stores. I introduced myself, and I said, hey, what do you think? How, does, how would this work on your shelf? Got them totally engaged, those three, by the way, Grizzly, Crisco, and Belgrade. And by the time we all came to fruition, I'll add more in the middle, but by the time it all came to fruition, I had my product out, they ordered the very first day, and they ordered multiple cases the very first day, and I signed the back of the bottles. Each one of the bottles gets signed. I signed those cases that went to those stores. Thank you, Grizzly Liquor. Thank you, Crisco. Thank you, Belgrade Liquor. But the market research that we did in the beginning is what told us what we could do. I, I knew that Grey Goose sold at $40 plus. It cost about $3 because it's made at an at a, at a ethanol refinery. But I also knew I couldn't play in that same game. Now, I mean, there's a, there's a market for premium products. But usually that market is accompanied by money behind the brand. It's going to be celebrity spokespeople. It's going to be cars. It's going to be whatever it is. It's something nuts. Um, even though the, the cost to make it is no different than my cost, generally speaking, um, they can charge much more for it because they can put something else to it. And so when we looked at that data, what that really showed us was that there was the ability to um, sell at a price point that we thought was more commensurate with what the Montana market could, could sustain. So when we looked at that, we found that, okay, well, Hendrix was selling at X, and the gin that you sell, you get on a well. When you walk in, you just get a gin and tonic out of the well, Montana Silver, which, by the way, is made over in Oregon. Um, when you get Montana Silver, that sells at a much different price point. And we tried to figure where in the middle did we want to, want to be. Because, I mean, I do, I do live in Butte. I, I grew up in Butte. I slummed in Missoula for my first degree, had a great time. Um, I did a whole bunch of other things, lived in China, England, and various couple other places. But I knew that in Butte, my price point couldn't be a premium price point. We are a shot in a beer town, all right? And if I was going to bring something new and fresh to that, it's not going to be at $35, $40. And so I built a little bit of my market around what the data told me the state would pay, a little bit about what Butte would pay, and then um, and that sort of helped me define from a market, uh, uh, from marketing plan perspective, how I was going to chase our product out into the world. Now, Chicago, we're also distributed in Chicago right now. The reason I went to Chicago right away is that, well, one, Chicago has got a bunch of Butte expats in it. You'd be really surprised how many Butte America expats are out there. Um, but what's also interesting about it is that it was the last place I built my, the place I built my last refinery. So I spent two years in West Chicago. All right, I lived in a hotel. You know, my personal bartender in that hotel is now a brand ambassador for Headframe Spirits. She lives in Chicago and now just schleps Headframe Spirits for us. But, um, but I knew a whole bunch of people. So the, the other point there was that although I didn't have Chicago totally nailed, I had this um, strategy which was go where you know. So I knew the area, I knew the people, I knew the bars um, because I had lived there damn near out of a hotel for about two years that it, was, it made sense to go where I knew. So you find that uh, relationships that you've built with people are were your biggest uh, advantage, I guess? 100%. 100%. Um, the, I think, you know, this new co-packaging entity that we're opening, we've got people coming to us and they just want peanut butter cup vodka and they've got the funny label and they don't want their name associated, they don't want anything associated. They've already got a distributor ready to take everything off the dock the day after it's made and they're going to sell it and they don't care anything about it. There's, they just want their paycheck at the end. And these guys are like hedge fund managers, things like that. Um, but when it's, when it's worked for Courtney and I is this very direct and personal relationship. And the problem, of course, with a brand is that if you're going to go anything past a, a service industry, where it's a consultant just you know, doing, a, doing like a lawyer or accountant or a, you know, my wife was in IT, she had an IT consulting firm before this, um, it's very one-on-one. -on -one. It's very easy to build a relationship and build trust that way. And I can go into all these bars, I can go into these liquor stores, I can talk to these people and I can make that relationship, but the second I leave, someone else is coming in trying to make a relationship after that. And ultimately, they're not the people buying my booze anyway. It's the customer that comes in and buys from them, whom I never really ever see. So it is a different perspective, but I know that as far as getting our place going, um, here, I'll share, I'll share a horror story with you. So I had the 504, 
guarantee from the Small Business Administration. I had the 7A guarantee from the Small Business Administration. I had the bank, the Value Add Agriculture Manufacturing Ag, Ag Bank on board. Everything's signed. Goes through the Montana uh, branch of the Small Business Administration. They approve everything. It goes down to the regional down in uh, uh, Southern California. Hits their desk and they denied it. It's never happened. Ever. And I, that was it. I mean, we were done. Courtney and I had been eating ramen for two weeks. We were out of money. Uh, the kids were, they were still eating good food, but we weren't. Uh, we were totally out of money. We were sunk. We were done. But one of the guys who had sort of been a big proponent and a big fan of ours from day one, uh, Butte Rat, who during um, Bush 1 was the director of that SBA. And he had heard about it. He said, what the hell just happened? We said, we don't know. And he got on the phone, and it was the relationship we had with him. He got on the phone, called down there on a Friday afternoon. At, it was 4.30 here, so it was 3.30 there. We got the call at 6.30 that they had turned it around and approved the loan. So we were sunk. We were done. And there was a relationship there that really d doesn't matter how much hard work we did. And we found out later on the reason we got denied is that the SBA group down there, the local CDC group, had made a loan, a 504. They had approved it. And it just happened to be local. And it was a distillery. And it totally bombed. It tanked and it lost all its money. So they had a very local and a very personal sort of bad experience there and just didn't believe, no matter how many other people came behind us and worked on our plan with us and showed that it could work. Uh, they just didn't believe. And so without that relationship, we were sunk. Absolutely. So when I think of different spirit, spirits, and I, and I think of the stories behind it, mm -hmm. I, kind of, I kind of envision maybe a human brand that could be a high rank brand. Mm -hmm. Given your understanding of the market and my lack of understanding, I know that you have to position it mm -hmm. to be able to sell and to get going in the long term. Do you, do you feel like you're going to outrun that decision in that? Or do you feel like Enframe can still change its price point to be a more high-end brand? That's a really great question. Um, we're a little lucky in this regard, and I'm going to tell you why in just a sec, but we are head frame spirits. What the head frame was is these were the big old elevators on the Butte Hill, the ones we light up at red at night, and these lowered the guys up and down in the mines. Okay, so each one of the head frames, each one of our products is named after a mine on the Butte Hill. Well, in the directory we have sitting in my office, the phone directory from 1911, there are over 800 mines on the Butte Hill. So we have 800 different brand names that we can pull from. Underneath the core brand of Headframe, there's 800 different sub-brands that we can pull from. And so we do have product that we're laying into barrels right now, single, single malts, rye, um, some rums, some tequilas, various other things, that if any of those potentially show up at a, at a product quality that we appreciate, then those are ones we can set up to be uniquely higher priced products underneath the brand while maintaining the price points that, that we've currently established for our brands. Um, and that's been a challenge because really like our original price model, marketing plan and all, was sort of a, you know, it was a, just a swing. I mean, I, I didn't know if it'd sell. I mean, we didn't know if it'd sell until we got it all put together and we opened the door. You can go home, you can make beer. You can go home, you make wine. You can practice. You go home and make hooch and you get busted. It's five years and $50,000 in a federal penitentiary, not a state. Federal penitentiary. So you don't get to practice legally. You can't make some like you can at a microbrewery or just homebrew and then go to a bank and set this down on the bus. Say, look, this is what I can make. Help me finance and get some money out there. Um, so we didn't know that this would work. And so the prices I've got set up were really, I've got to be honest with you, they were, there was a lot of research put into it, but eventually, I had narrowed it down to sort of a range, but we had to pick something in there and see if it worked. And luckily, it's worked so far. Um, but we do have a look at a lot of different price points on some of the products we're coming out with, you know, single barrel products or various other things that are unique or special that might just be a one out kind of product. Like it'll be out and it'll never be out again. Um, and those kind of products, we do see the ability to ask different price points on. In that industry, if you do a one out product, is that, is that lucrative enough financially? to do it, or is it a lucrative enough move brand-wise to do it? Um, both. Um, if we talk about, there's a bourbon, let's talk hooch specifically. There's a bourbon out there called Pappy Van Winkle. Maybe you've heard of it, maybe you haven't. It's a 23-year expression of bourbon out of Kentucky. Uh, what's unique about it is that when you put booze in barrels, it evaporates about every year it evaporates. And so by the time they get to the bottom of a 23-year barrel, it's a 53-gallon barrel they filled, they've got about four gallons left. And you get about five bottles per gallon. 
So you've got sunk cost of 23 years of storage, of insurance, of everything else, and you've got four gallons or about 20 bottles left. And so what they did was that the product's okay. Don't get me wrong, it's not bad. It is not a $700 bottle of bourbon, but it sells. And not only that, it sells every single year. And the allotment is such that each state gets an allotment, and then inside the state, you, you know, liquor stores get the allotment. Um, our lead distiller, is a, he's a freaking bourbon nerd, and he loves it. And he found out where Pappy was going this year in, in Montana, and he was getting it. He called the liquor store. He was getting in the car to go there and get it. And a private jet had just landed, and the guy's man had shown up with cash and took every bottle off the shelf and left the cash and flew back to wherever he was from. So there is this perception in our market that you can ask for these goofy price points for things that are perceived to be rare or are rare. Um, and it does work. I mean, there are micros out right now. There's a very great micro. We made a couple of different case studies of micro distilleries. One of them is called Tuthill Town. They're out of New York, just out of the city. Uh, Tuthill Town? And they're brilliant. I love these guys. They've figured out that we're a marketing company first. But they sell a four-month-old bourbon in a half bottle, so in 375, okay? So it's a half-size fifth. They sell that for a double a fifth price, 140 bucks. It's four-month-old bourbon. Okay, you go down and you buy Evan Williams Black, which, by the way, is the best bourbon for your dollar in the world, period. Go to the liquor store and buy Evan Williams Black. That's about a four-year bourbon. You can get a fifth of it for about $13, $14, and is hands down the best bourbon in the world for that price point and that age. These guys sold a four-month-old bourbon. And, it's, it's, and they even found a great name for it. It's called Baby Bourbon. All right, and they sold the hell out of it at double the cost of an actual fifth. So there's other ways to play this market that, you know, it depends on your way to craft your message. And so when we looked at Tuthill Town specifically for our case studies that we did against other distilleries out there, the case study of, of Tuthill Town was how did they market themselves to convince someone that they could buy a 40 month old product which is considered youthful in any brown spirit by a factor of like six. I mean, it should be at least two years old. That they convinced their market, not only was it worth buying, but it was worth paying four times as much as the competitor in the next largest size bottle. That's awesome. And you know what? They sell the hell out of it. They really do. They really do. So, what's, uh, I guess I got a couple of questions. Here. Please. For what, what's, what's your uh, legal form of organization? How did you choose it? Okay. And two is like, it's, it's uh, one of the uh, most challenging aspects of the construction business you talked about, which was the capital constraints for raising your capital. So, did you have to secure any part of those loans? You said you were eating ramen. Did you have to put your house up? Cool, cool. Uh, we have, well now we have, um, Courtney's really pissed because now we have a few more businesses than we really planned on having and of course the paperwork and everything else that goes with those. But we have an LLC that is the, the real estate holding company that holds the building and it holds any other leases that we do or where we do store things. And then the corporation itself, Headframe, is an S Corp that leases from the real estate holding company. Um, various reasons, if you have a good accountant, they're gonna help you figure out the best route for yourself, but ours is an S-Corp. Um, and then back to the financing part, um, although we were design build, and although it sounds like you know we went public, I mean, we were traded on NASDAQ when we were doing biodiesel, and we did a lot of different things. You'd think I'd be driving a Hummer, I wasn't. I was working, I was living in nappy hotels, and work in 16 hour days. And ultimately when that was all done, the, the growth had been planned out, you know, sell and build three to four different distilleries, take the cash load from that, go build our own, and then retire. And we got done with the fourth one when the recession hit. So we didn't really have a lot of money at home. Courtney had her own business. I had enough that I got out of that um, that we were able to just you know, keep the bills paid and everything else, but we went very, very quickly from uh, deciding we were gonna do this distillery, um, going to a very bare bones existence as far as, you know, what we were doing, what we'd spend money on, how we'd spend money, and saved as much as we could. And so one of our things was we needed to have a building. So here's the other thing about booze. You're not allowed to submit your application for your federal distiller's license until you either own the building you're going to put it in or have a signed 10-year lease. 
And if you don't have those two things, they're not even going to look at your license. Now, there isn't to say they're going to give you a license. You submit that, they might just still say no. In which case, you own a building or you have a 10-year lease you have to get out of, and neither one's cheap. So what we did in Butte is that, what's nice about Butte is that we've got about a million square foot in the uptown that's, un, that's unoccupied right now. Um, we used to have 100,000 people. We've got 30,000 people now. We still have buildings for 100,000 people. So it's, it's relatively, the, the, the real estate's relatively inexpensive as compared to, say, downtown Missoula. So we looked at buildings for a long time. We had a very specific set of criteria, about 13, 16 different sets of criteria we need to meet. We went through about 14 buildings and we found it. And this is over the course of about six, eight months. We still didn't have financing, but we, we had to find a building and roll it into the plan because the financing had to know how much they wanted, they're going to have to pay for a building. So this building comes on the market, we find it. It needs work, but it's a cat's meow as far as what we needed. And we were, very, you know, we were very shrewd in that we weren't just jumping on the first thing that showed up. And we really spent a lot of time looking at things and evaluating things. But this thing came up. We said, great, let's go get it. Um, and the bank that was working, we still didn't have this ag bank yet. We still, we had the 504 loan guarantees from, this, from the SBA, but we hadn't yet finished shopping the project. And we'd been shot down by about three different banks. There was, you know, we still had those five others to go before we eventually found the ag bank. And this building came up. And we decided, okay, we have to get this building because this is the right one, the right location, the right set of criteria. This is what we need. So we bought the building. And when they said, buy the building, no problem, throw your cash in the game. And we threw our cash in the game. And what was lucky about that is that by the time we got to the Ag Bank, that was right when we were on ramen because we, we threw our cash in the game. We continued to work the project from a financing perspective, from an equipment perspective, and tightening up the numbers we're going to need for the final loan. But we got shot down five more times. So now we've got a building that we couldn't afford all in. I mean, we found a really great bank in Butte that was willing to do a short-term loan for us just to secure the building so it didn't get lost in the sales. But they carried that another month, another month, and they really helped us out, but they weren't willing to do the whole project. And so we were really sort of on fumes by the time we got this whole thing wrapped up. But what was nice about it is we were able to take the capital value, if you will, of that building, its appraised value, turn that back into the SBA um, expenditure as our contribution to the SBA note. Because the way SBA works is that the SBA is going to secure 50% of your note, the bank has to secure the other 35, and then you have to put 15% of the total value of the project down cash cash. Um, now, we said oh, we made an argument, which luckily we were, we were able to prevail upon, which was our cash cash is sitting in this building, so let's use that. And they did accept that. But the one thing we did early on is we made a very solid and very you know, reasoned decision that we had no desire to bring anyone else into the company. It was Courtney and I. And a little bit of that comes from the biodiesel one in that it was six of us, or you know, five, five other guys than me, it was six of us that did the biodiesel company. We were doing great. We got the first place sold. It was about a $12 million project. And uh, the state, and that time it was Iowa, that we were building this refinery, came to us and said, no problem, but you got to bond the whole value. We're like, we're six guys. I mean, we're, we're running off. Again, we're design build until you sell the first one. You got no money. So we're like, how do, we, how do we bond a $12 million project without putting our houses and everything else up? And we elected to go public. And we reverse merged actually through uh, a company called Nova uh, by the guy who did the reverse merger of Blockbuster Video uh, a while back. That seemed like a great idea. It gave us the capital, it gave us the back to bond this project. And by the time we went to build the second one, we were no longer in control of the company. So we took a, Courtney and I took a very concerted look at that and said, now this is not how we're do it. We want to own the place. And if we're going to F up, it's on us but we don't want anyone to take it away from us either. So we did have to put our house up. Um, we had to put a second on the house. Um, I think I had to leverage my firstborn child and like the first three kids for my daughter or something. I mean, it was like all <laughs> in, okay? But once I did that, we were able to get this going. There was one very small portion of what you call a friends and family contribution to it, and they were paid off instantly. Um, that was mostly to secure that front end before the full financing was done to make sure we could feed the kids. But after that, we paid that off and we've been free and clear and it's just us ever since. So always be cautious of even friends and family investors or angels or anyone else. Um, angels 
always want more than what it seems, and they're going to take it. And uh, friends and family, you should want to see them at Thanksgiving and Christmas. And if you F up and they happen to be your money, you might not want to see them. They might not want to see you either. So also be cautious about friends and family kind of stuff. So I know it sounds weird, hey, go out and do it all on your own. But uh, it's a little bit of what I'm trying to say is that ultimately it's on you to do it right. But it's also on you to, to accept the damage that you might do on your own as well. You control your own company. Yeah, you know, you do. But we don't, I mean, we do control our own company. Don't get me wrong. Courtney and I are, you know, we, we set up what we wanted to do, and we set a very strong foundation for everyone in the company. And then we hire business unit managers that we really believe in. So our manufacturing company is run by uh, the manufacturing arm of our company, which is a separate S Corp, by the way, is run by the guy who used to be the lead engineer at that biodiesel company. After we closed that about four years ago, he, worked at, he went to work at INL down in Idaho. He was decommissioning a nuclear reactor. And I called him up last year and I said, please come back. And he said, cool. So now he makes stills. But he's also in charge of that whole group. So I literally, I was there today. I don't, have, well, and I don't have an office. I've got a laptop and my messenger bag. I don't even have an office anymore. But I was at his place today, at his warehouse today. And I go in and he runs the show. I'm not allowed to call the shots in there. And that's my rule. And it's the same thing in our tasting room uptown. Um, Heidi, she runs all of that up there. Same reason. We find good people and we put them in charge of stuff and we give them the foundation we want them to, to follow, but then we get the F out of their way and we give them what they need to get their jobs done. Same thing. I was, um, I was the distiller. I was doing all this work. I haven't distilled anything now for about six months. I've got a master distiller in there now who um, is brilliant. Um, and same thing, he's in charge of his group and he's in charge of his people. And I'll give him like a quota that I want and I give him the resources and the money to buy with things he needs to get those things done. But I don't step on his toes because I hired him to, to take care of that and then my goal is to ensure him that he knows I have his trust, like go do it. So that's been one of the things that maybe I could actually add to our motto mantra thing up there is find good people and get the hell out of their way if you're gonna have a business that's larger than yourself. Um, and that's worked really very well for us. Although, yeah, it is Courtney and I, everyone's got their own business unit. They manage their own money. They manage their expenses. We watch over that and guide, but we don't make those decisions. And like I said, we are following the New Belgium model. We are selling this to the employees. They all know this. And we are selling this company to the employees in about three and a half years. That's worked out really well for you as far so, as so. keeping people motivated. It does, it does. But you know, you can also get the wrong people in there too that are just sticking around for that nut. Right. And I think it takes a little bit. We didn't tell anyone we were selling the company to them until we'd been going for a while because we wanted to make sure that it wasn't like we were worried we hadn't picked the right people, but we were per worried about the, the reason they were coming in. And so the reason they wanted to be there is because they wanted to be there. You ha we had to find them and they had to really dig it and have a good time doing it. And we really do. I mean, we call day drunks, all right? There was a really bad day last summer, and we were just, everyone was tired and bushed. And I said, everybody, drop it. Just whatever you're doing, drop it. Call in your backup. We're out. And I threw everybody in the rafts, and we just floated the big hole all day and just got drunk, all right? And we called, we called cabs at the end to just pick us up and take us back. Um, because you have to, not only do you have to find the people that you care about and you want to work with, but if you're going to put them in charge of something, you've got to know they want to be in charge of it. And then you got to recognize when they're just bushed and they're tired, and it's time to give them a freaking break. And that's that same thing. So that's sort of how we play. Can you maybe go into how you've gone about finding those people? If you have any methods of attracting good people that have worked, and just particularly like with hiring somebody with a specialized expertise, like a master distiller or a manufacturer, like are those people from Montana? Did you have to recruit from outside? Did you want to get them to come and want to stay? Awesome. Well, let me break them down by business units. We have the tasting room, Heidi. Uh, Heidi was our daycare provider. Uh, and so, so we have two kids, Tuesday and Cooper. Cooper's eight. And so she was Cooper's daycare provider. She had him basically from like month six until he went off to kindergarten. And what we really dug about her very early on, way before we had a distillery or anything else, I was called back, you know, I was coming back into town for one of my jobs. Courtney's like, hey, great timing. 
let's go to the parent-teacher conference at the daycare. I'm like, Cooper is eight months old. What are we getting out of a parent-teacher conference? She's like, just shut up and let's go. And I was like, all right. So we went and we were scheduled the last in the day and we walk in and we sit down and Heidi, all, all the other kids are gone. It's just Cooper playing and Heidi and us and she gets out the cocktails and we just sat there and we had cocktails. And it's just because she, she wanted to know us better. She's like, your kid's awesome, he's fine, don't worry about him. And we had a really nice time. And then over the years, that friendship just sort of progressed. And so what happened was, after we opened the place, again, it was Courtney and I, first 12 months, 16 months, that's all it was going to be. Um, we paid off our operating note the fourth day we were open. We were slammed the second we opened the door. We didn't sleep for the first week. So Heidi sees this, she's like, all right, this is nuts. And by this point, she owns her own daycare. So at the time of the cocktail day, that was a different daycare. She owns her own daycare. And she was running her daycare all day long. At 5.01, she was walking out of the daycare when the last kid left, and she came up and worked our tasting room until 9 o'clock because we were falling down, she could tell. And she came up, and she just owned it. All right? She started making up new cocktails. She started, you know, just owned it. And we recognized that, and pretty soon thereafter, about a month in, we figured out, okay, oh, well, this is actually okay. We're able to make payroll. We're paying our bills. Heidi, um, would you like to have this whole thing? Because by this point, we had known her for about six years. We were friends, but we also had a business relationship already. If we didn't show up at 5 o'clock to pick Cooper up from school, she'd give us a call, which never happened, but she would have given us a call. And if we didn't show up by 525, she's calling DFS because there was a relationship there that was a professional relationship outside of our personal relationship. And what we saw in that and her specifically was that we could bring her into head frame and give her a business unit and have that same sort of thing happen now on another dynamic. So what did she do? She gave her clients about six weeks to find new daycare and she shut down her own business and came and took over that one. Uh, the manufacturing group, Mark uh, Chaddock, the guy I worked with at Biosource, so we worked together for a long time. I mean, we've got scars on our back that aren't figurative, they're literal. Um, from working together out in the field, working pumps, pipes, things like this. And he was, what he was before is he was a boiler maker, literally one of the guys like out at coal strip inside the frickin' things, welding, grinding. And he was in there one day, about 20, 25 years ago, and he asked the senior guy there, you know, how does this thing work? And the guy's like, I have no idea, we just come in here and weld. And Mark pretty much dropped his tools right there and got a master's degree in mechanical engineering because he wanted to know how it worked. So not only does he know how to weld on it, but he knows how it works. And so when we worked together all those years, he taught me a lot about how I do what I do now, which is, you know, make things, build things, put things together. And so asking him to come back in, we had already worked together for about seven years at Biosource under the biodiesel thing. We'd already worked together. And so it was an easy fit for him to come back in and take over that business unit. And then finally the distiller, I knew how to make fuel, right? Now distilling is easy, don't get me wrong. Distilling is freaking simple. Actually making something worth distilling is the hard part. Okay, so it's the same thing. If it's in fuel and you screw up your mix of grease and methanol and, and caustic, you're not going to have biodiesel that you can put into a tank. doesn't matter how many times you distill it or how you run the stills, you're just not going to get it. Well, it's the same thing in booze. All right, I can make angel tears on the back end of the still, but only if what I'm putting in at least came from an angel to begin with. You know, to distill is to, to concentrate the essence of. If you make junk, if you make crap, you're going to distill the essence of oh, crap. And it's not going to be any good, okay? So one of the things I recognized very early on is I knew how to run the stills and I knew how to make fuel. What I didn't know how to do is I didn't know how to make a beer, which is really all we do. We All we do is make beer and distill the beer to get the hooch out. That's all whiskey, vodka, gin is, is beer. I didn't know how to make the beer at 1,000-gallon batches on spec to make sure that when I started making booze, it would be consistent and it'd be worth drinking. And so what I did was, this is where you guys probably need to all reevaluate your degrees if you're still in school and change really fast. Uh, go to Michigan State University. They have a master's program in distillation science and beverage alcohol distillation science. So I called them up because they also have a consulting group that's sort of like a joint venture with the university. And one of the guys who graduated, from, two of the guys who graduated from the university were in this consulting group. And basically what they do is they say, okay, you're a micro distiller and you want to learn how to make a rye whiskey. Okay, come here for a week. We'll mash, ferment, and distill on our equipment. We'll give you the recipes. We'll give you all the procedures and you know, everything else. That's what you pay us for. And then you go back and you can open your distillery and be can, you know, reasonably assured that you can make a consistent product. So I went there and I met these two guys and they're brilliant. Um, and one of them 
went to Death's Door, left Michigan State in this joint venture, went to Death's Door Distilling out of Wisconsin. The other one uh, came to me. And so now these guys, between the two of them, have started up or done recipes for over 300 of the current 700 micro distilleries in America, and of the two of them. And one of them is working as my distiller now. But the same thing, he had an offer from Beam. Jim Beam, I mean, crap, how do you beat Jim Beam? And I'm exhausted. This is last summer. Heidi's finally shut down the daycare. She's there, and whoa. Mark still isn't about to come on board for another 10 months. But I needed someone in there running production because I was Marketing. Yeah, I was marketing and I you know, lost 35 pounds and you know, wasn't sleeping because there was so much work to be done. But absolutely, I was marketing. I had a marketing company and I had to get booze out the door. And I knew he knew how to make it. And so I called him up and I said, hey, would you come work here? And he said, hey, I've got an offer from Beam. And I said, well, I can't beat it. But I know that at Beam, they're going to make you a distillation monkey. They're never, ever, ever, ever going to let you vary the recipe. They're not going to let you experiment. They're not going to let you do anything outside of the very tightly controlled boundary of what makes Jim Beam. And that's awesome. That's, that's what you're supposed to be doing. But what I said, if you come here, I'll give you the distillery. I will give you the business manager of that distillery. You'll be in charge of the warehouseman. You'll be in charge of the bottling line. You'll be in charge of a completely new and unique set of stills. Our stills do not work like any other stills in the industry. And you'll be in charge, completely in charge of these. You can experiment. You can do all these kinds of other things after you make your, make your quota for me. And I can't beat Beam. And he said, well, fly me out there. Let's hang out. And he flew out. We had a great week. We put the job offer down on, his de uh, on the floor in front of him in the distillery a Friday night. He's flying out on Saturday morning. And we're chit-chatting. And Courtney grabs it off the floor and grabs her pen and writes down one more bullet on the job offer and throws it back down on the floor. And we already know we can't beat Beam. And he knows we can't beat Beam. And he wasn't really waffling, but I think he was having fun, just sort of like, you know, I sort of like it here, but what can they do? And the number wasn't awesome, but everything else was. And then he said, what did you just write? She's like, well, pick it up. And he picks it up, and down at the bottom, I didn't know what she wrote until she picked it up, until he picked it up too. And down at the bottom, it said, you have to go out and play with us at least once a month. We're going to go out and get hammered. We're going to go skiing. We're going to take the kids fishing. Whatever it is, you have to come play. And that was like the last bullet point on his job offer. And so how do we get these people? I don't know. Mark, we knew. Heidi, we knew. Justin, I went and asked him to teach me how to make booze. And ultimately, I think it was, it was we were able to give each one of these people much more than just a job. We were able to give them the responsibility of these business units. Now, the people underneath them, the same way. They're all totally in charge of their destinies down there. And we've just got brilliant people top to bottom. So I guess, uh, I don't know if this sort of sums it up, what you're saying. Is it you find people that are passionate about what they're doing? They're passionate about being where they're at, and you see that they like to be there. And yeah. that says more than someone who's maybe necessarily talented or has connections. Absolutely. Or they want to work hard for it because they care about it. Absolutely. I mean, we, we have found that if you've got the time as, an, as a manager or owner, I found this back at the Biodiesel World too, if you've got the time, you can teach anyone to do anything. I have a degree in psychology and I can design distillation columns. You can teach anyone to do anything so long as they actually have the passion and drive to do it. But if you get somebody that doesn't care or doesn't really want to learn or doesn't really want to try, even if they're brilliant at it, they're not going to give you as much as that person who really, really, really cares because they're willing to try and they're willing to learn. So in our, our staff underneath Heidi's side, on her side, the tasting room staff right now from a marketing perspective is really a lot of our initial face on the world. It was the tasting room that people first met us, met our product, and then they go home and they might go to a liquor store and buy it. They might come all the way back to Missoula and then go ask Grizzly for it. But the people they meet are that crew behind the, the tasting room. Um, and we have that same perspective down there. Most people behind the bar in our tasting room, which is a very, I mean, simple syrups and shrubs and muddled and all that, I mean, very difficult things to do. Most of them never bartended a day in their life before they started with us. But what we saw was they were just crazy fun and they really cared about what they did and that part we can't train. We knew we could train them to make a gin and tonic or a gin fizz or we can train them to do that. We can't train them to want to be I there. I noticed that I was there, I don't think, I've only been there once and was We're right there, up. Um, Thank you. Uh, folk Fest. Oh. And it was packed. Yeah. But uh, that, was, that was the one thing I noticed was that 
the the bartender, whoever it was, she was very uh, engaging with us, and it's like we're just ordering our drinks. And I figured, yeah, I'm gonna get my drink and one lady tip. And there's two people here, sure. and she's like trying to have a conversation sure. with us. And, and you know, and while they're doing that too, they probably had two bottles in each hand. They're pouring for the person next to you while they're chit chatting with you. And it's Introduce, and that's that can't be trained. I mean, that's not something we can sit down and get somebody to do. And so, as a result, we pay them over minimum. We bonus them out all the time. We're always constantly doing things for them, just because once you again, once you find them, take care of them. It's so retarded, Um You alluded a little bit to how you can go off and you can homebrew and you can perfect your recipe. Mm -hmm. and you can learn the the process. Mm -hmm. And because of the licensing requirements, the government regulations, the TTB, you can't do that. Sure. Distillation. That's correct. What are the licensing and government, government or governing issues that you've run into trying to build stills and sell to people? Okay, um, none. Um, and here's why. I can't come just buy a still from you. Sure you can. Yeah. Just can't talk it up. You just can't. Just can't I just can't fire it up. Just can't fire it up. Uh, in the, and so here's how you come to that answer is that stills are, you know, for the most part, stills don't make booze. Most of the output, 99% of everything that is made on a still, on a column in the United States, is the gas that goes in your tank or the diesel that goes in your tank. Kerosene, all that. That's all being fracked on stills. Um, and so stills is a science. Anyone can make a still. Anyone could, it's just the hooking it up part and why you hook it up. So underneath the CFR, um, there is a specific call out for stills for private individuals and you're totally allowed to own one until the energy source, be it steam or electric, to provide the heat and the cooling source, water, is hooked up. Until those two things are hooked up, you are in the free and the clear. So but, but there's different things. When you're talking about manufacturing something, so our entire manufacturing arm, you have to have a professional engineer on staff. That's Mark. You have to build to, to standards that are acceptable for pressurized equipment. You know, there's various things, depending on what you're going to build, that are going to be standardized via the regulations or via law, and you need to build to those. Um, you know, pressure vessels, you can't build a pressure vessel or have a pressure vessel built legally for sale unless it's stamped by a professional engineer. So, you, you know, even though our stills are not pressure vessels, we, we build to that standard. So, from the building the still side, meh, do whatever the heck you want. Uh, turn it on and live in fear because it's really bad. It's really, really bad. Um, but uh, to the side of making booze, um, this is what unique about at least my industry, and I don't know about everybody else's industry and what approaches they're gonna have to take to get to where they go, but the one thing in but the biodiesel world where we ever lost, and I mean ever, other than the fact the recession totally took us out, um, the only place we really ever lost is when we didn't pay attention to the legislative side of things. Okay, you can be in an industry and think you're completely unaffected by what's happening, leg happening legislatively and come to find out that one of your competitors especially made a law that says all oh, the biodiesel has to be blue. And they figured out a way why that had to be law and there's no way your biodiesel can be made blue. Well, this, didn't, this example specifically didn't happen. But if you're not paying attention legislatively, these things get you. And so what I did, in fact, on this one, before I had my distillery, before I had my federal license or my state license, I actually went to the Montana State Legislature in the, not this just last session, but the one back before, and I got the tax rate on spirits, micro spirits, micro distilled spirits in uh, Montana decreased by half. And I did a couple other things, increase the volume you could sell from the tasting room, a couple other things. I got that changed around because I had two business plans. I had one business plan with the laws it was. I had one business plan if I could get these laws changed. And I had the numbers that changed that were different as a result. So I went and got the laws changed. And then I had a solider, solider. I had a more solid business plan. My wife got a degree in English. She'd be really pissed when she sees this. Um, <laughs> a more solid business plan as a result of having paid attention legislatively as well. So regardless of what your business is, if you're not paying attention to what, how you're bound by the laws and then the regulations that are built from the laws, if you're not paying attention to how you're bound by those, um, you're missing out on some core aspects of your business that you might not know about. If you could, what would you have done differently? Um, we tell people this a lot. If we could have done something differently, 
we would have spent a little more time on planning for what happened if it actually went okay or went well. Like most, like everyone tells you, right? And it's absolutely true. Don't not do this, do this. Plan as if you're not going to eat for the first year, okay? Plan as if you're not going to sleep. I mean, how do you get a business off the ground where you're not bringing in money for the first four or five months and you're not paying your bills? With, how are you going to handle that and make sure you get through that and plan for that appropriately? That's what we did. Like all good you know, business plans you're supposed to do. What we got zonked on was, yeah, the fourth day, we didn't touch our operating note again. And we've been living off operating cash ever since. Now, we still have the note, but it's got a zero balance. We just got it in case we need it. But we didn't, we didn't plan for the growth side of it in case things went really well. Now, that's not to say that I need to spend seven months planning out the, in case things go very well, like I spent seven months planning out in case things go really bad. But the problem was is that Courtney and I, after the first, you know, up through the first eight months, we spent a lot of chicken with its head cut off kind of approach to reacting to what was happening. In that, you know, we procure bottles, okay, just for instance. When we order bottles, you don't just call up and say, send me another pallet. You have to call up and say, send me 60,000 bottles. And the lead time's four months. Okay, so the first order, to ask her it, I only need you know, I did all the numbers, made my performer. First year, all I need is 30,000. That'll have another 25% more than I actually think I'm going to need. So I got a 25% cushion of what I need. We needed to order again within the first four months. And we almost ran out. In fact, we have two different product lines. We got, we got products that come in clear bottles and the Orphan Girl that comes in a brown bottle. So I thought, well, the Orphan Girl is going to be totally this boutique product. I really didn't think the Orphan Girl was going to sell that much. So I've got four products in the Orphan Girl. And the Orphan Girl needs a brown bottle because it's cream. You can't put cream in a clear bottle because it's not stable with sunlight. So OK, cool. It's going to be about 20% of my sales by my pro forma. Then I should probably, out of you know, 30,000 bottles, I should probably be ordering about you know, 6,000 bottles. I'll be fine. Um, Orphan Girl is 47% of our sales. And it was from the first day. It's Moostrel. It's Fat Tire. It's an iconic brand of our business that we're actually known for more than generally our business name or the rest of it. So and then go back to your procurement cycle. Whoa. You know, you only ordered 20% of what you thought you were going to need. And that procurement cycle is four months out. And so we've spent a lot of time chasing the growth. And I think we've finally come to that stable point. We know what's going on. We can plan. We can anticipate now. Um, and we can look specifically to our future. I mean, we're taking Orphan Girl National next year um, because it is that kind of a brand. Um, but to do that, we can now look 16 months in advance and we can plan that out. We can know what kind of where I need to do and what the capital expenditures are going to be. Where in the beginning, we still had this business plan taped to the wall and we had this pro forma in our laptop. We're like, OK, well, we're at week two. And according to our pro forma, we're at month six for how much money we had brought in. And we, you can't plan for that greatly. But I think that we really do encourage people to think about their business plan. Spend one day, two days, in a very happy place, OK? Get yourself a six-pack of beer, a couple whiskeys, and think about what could actually happen in a good way with the business, and then at least build some very 30,000 foot views of what you're going to have to know and pay attention to. Like I said, you know, we totally, we totally borked how to order our bottles because we didn't understand what was going to happen with this one product that has a very unique bottle. So we had to really chase that after the fact. And I think that if we had had the chance or known might, what might have been coming and given ourselves a good, solid, quiet weekend with no phones, no interruptions, and just looked at some various key lynch points in the business plan and thought about, well, if we really take off, what would I need to do here, 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 and here to keep up with that? I think we would have made it a lot farther than we've made it so far. I think we'd have 40 FTE right now, if that was the case. How many states are licensed to sell in Illinois? Right now, we, we sell in Montana and Illinois. Um, the, uh, we're looking, like I said, we're looking to take at least the Orphan Girl National next year, but all the rest of the brands are going to have a slower market penetration. We're opening Taiwan. We're opening a couple other things. Um, but interestingly, um, our capacity right now at our distillery, if you take every, every other micro distillery in, in Montana right now, there's about 12. 
and you sum their capacity as if they ran 24-7 for a month, take all 12 and put that together, times five, we still make every 10 days is our capacity at the distillery. So from that perspective, um, we, uh, uh, we believe we've got the capacity to hit other markets, but right now, to be honest, until our new distillery goes online, until, you know, right now we do 60 cases a day packaged, like actually put into a box and package. By December 1, we'll be doing 2,000 cases a day. And until that capacity comes online, we can't service a national market. So we've had to use the cash that we generated beforehand, because again, now we are cash-based. You know, we're trying to do this now without leveraging Cooper again, um, <laughs> which we now, he, we own him again, which is great. Um, so by using that money now, we can leverage these other projects to then look at something, you know, the national rollout of Orphan Girl, we've been looking at for eight, nine months. So we've been able to leverage that money eight, nine months ago to make happen what we're happening now. So right now it's Montana, Illinois, but, and what's interesting about the Illinois one too is that there's a liquor store chain there that can mail stuff for us. So we get someone from out of state, they call us up and they say, I, I live in Oklahoma, how can I get your booze? I, I just send them right to Benny's.com. I say, you can buy it right off their website and they'll ship it to you because they're licensed to sell. So I use them as a downstream distributor. I have a question. Please. You have a family business. So yes. I'm wondering how do you and Courtney make it work that you work together on this business and still like each other when you go home? Ah. And also you have two kids. So how did you manage this whole process where with, in the lean times you protected them from the stress of that and in the crazy successful times you protect them from the downsides of that as well? Don't get cocky. I mean, really, that's what it comes down to is that um, they had no idea we were eating ramen. I mean, they were eating normal meals. They had no idea we were eating ramen. Okay, so of course, kids can never know this, right? Now, it's the same token. And Cooper and Tuesday, if you ever watch this years from now, don't listen to me now. But um, it's the same token on the other side. With this relative degree of success that we're having right now, I still wear old boots and we drive old cars and we don't, you know, we don't live a lavish life because. It, there's no reason for it. And so w the way we try to live our life is hopefully a little more indicative of just being normal. Now, we give gifts to their teachers at the end of every year, which you can't take onto school grounds, um, which is a thank you to them. And, we, and the kids find a way to give it to them. We're there with them, but the kids give them this present and say thank you. But we, we don't, we do a, an honest sort of thing to sort of say, look, yeah, we donate to the Folk Fest. And yeah, we're in the paper every other week now, or whatever's going on. We don't really talk about that with the kids. We just sort of are a family. We go home, we play Legos, we screw off, we go skiing, throw the kids in the river, whatever. Um, how Courtney and I do? Well, it's awesome because I married a very, very strong-willed woman, okay? And what's awesome about that is that she pushes back anytime I push. And she'll give ground every time I give ground. And as a result, I think what we found in our way is that if you walk into our distillery, even though this isn't how it really works anymore, the tasting room beside you're on, there's this big wall that runs down, it's got the art, and then on the other side's the distillery, right? So we used to call it, okay, my side of the wall, your side of the wall. Because generally I was speaking about production, getting things out the door. Generally she was speaking about the tasting room or keeping the, managing the finances. So what we've been able to do is find, even though it's, she's upstairs in a different office now, and I live out of my laptop bag and just wherever I find a flat spot is my office right now, um, day to day, it's a different spot. But we still have sort of her side of the wall and my side of the wall. And although we, um, we, we love to disagree, she's Italian, I'm Irish, so put that together. Um, uh, we love to disagree, what we generally do is about once a quarter we sit down and we say, okay, well, where's the business gone? where we want it to go in the next quarter, and then just set some 30,000 foot goals. Because then you're not, you're not discussing the minutia of each one of those every time it comes at you and hits you. You've planned for it, and then you just live and deal with it. So no, I mean, we're just like any other couple, all right? I mean, again, I'm Irish, she's Italian, so wow. But, um, but what we do know is that we are in charge of a business right now that is growing on its own. We're in charge of a business that if we put the goals in front of it and we put the right people in front of it, it's not about Courtney and John anymore. And so what we're able to do is that if, if there is a disagreement or we can't find a way to visualize how we want a, way, a business unit to go, 
as often as not, we can just get the hell out of the way and give it a week or two and see what the business unit does on its own. And generally speaking, it's always been the right choice. And it's usually a choice we didn't see. I, you know, I, I wanted to, but I thought I'd get busted being inside here. So, but. Uh, we invite undergrads to be part of our club and limits our yeah. opportunities. But, so maybe we can plan a, a road trip. Well, I'll go down to Draftworks and have a beer tonight because I, you know, I'll have the beer, buy you a shot there. Um, but yeah, I think what you really get is that if you want to start your own business, you got to love it more than anyone else. And if it's going to be a business that's bigger than yourself, you have to hire people that love it more than you. And that seems to have worked for us so far. Please, can you speak to either a marketing strategy that absolutely knocks your socks off, blew your expectations away, and start doing a product like more girls as a name? Or how you make it, how it tastes. I mean, what is your what driver is for the experience where you need to market spin and you know? Sure. Um, I know that right now, up to this point, if I pull up to like types of marketing, and then I'll go down to that question there. Um, social marketing, social media, oh, it's worth its weight in freaking gold, okay? I've been, we've been, you know, we t took a look at the quarter ad in the, the Sky West magazine on Delta. A quarter page ad is $40,000 for a month. I don't got that. I don't got that right now, okay? So what do we do? We use social media a lot to sort of, from, from a platform from which to establish our brand. Now, the other thing about us, and I'm going to call it a little bit of luck and a little bit of foresight, is that I grew up in Butte. Okay, we don't call ourselves Butte, Montana. We call ourselves Butte, America. All right, we really, there is something different down there that we really like. And there's a lot of Butte expats out in the world that are fiercely loyal to Butte. Okay, I was one of those. I was here in Missoula. I was living in England, China, where I was fiercely freaking loyal to Butte. And we thought about that. And we thought about, well, how could we do this? How could we, how could we share what is Butte? And when we fell on, at least our brand itself, being about the history of Butte, being about its past, we sort of co-branded our product to the history of our town. And so in point of fact, a couple months ago, I got a call from this liquor store down in Memphis. And this guy, literally, I just said, hey, this is John from Headframe. And he's like, first off, who the hell are you? And second off, why do people keep coming in here asking for you? And I'm like, they ask for, what you, what? he's like, well, yeah, they keep coming in asking for this orphan girl thing. And I said, are they sort of mean about it? He's like, no, but they're really persistent. And I said, did they say where they're from? They said, yeah, they're from Butte, America. And I said, aha. <laughs> and um, what we found pretty early on is that w our concept was to co-brand ourselves to our place and to use what was special, that we feel is special about our place to, 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 to share that message via our brand. And what's been really cool about that is even if you're not from Butte, America, people start asking questions about the orphan girl or never sweat. They want to know what the story is. And so it's more than just Dell computer. I mean, we could have called this thing McKee Distillery. We didn't because there's not a lot of story. I, I'll talk all night, but honestly, there's not a lot of story behind John McKee. Okay, and I love Ryan and Jenny down at Montgomery's Distillery, but that's their last name. I mean, ultimately, the story is going to be their story, but not too much deep, deeper or not too much broader. But with Headframe Spirits, and the, just that one directory from the 1911 directory, the 1914 directory that we have back at the office, I've got 800 names of products, of mines, that I can eventually turn into products. And I can spread across that base to really bring that history into what we share from a marketing perspective. Now, the orphan girl itself, well, let's not talk about the orphan. Let's talk about all the products in booze in general. And maybe this is true for a lot of different things. You guys can think about it from your own industry perspective. I can get you to buy the first bottle. I guarantee you. Okay? It's $110. I'll get you to buy it. But if it's crap, you're not going to buy the second one. Or if it's not well priced, if I chose the wrong price point, you're not going to buy the second one. But if I choose the right price point, and what I put in the bottle is worth drinking, and actually you sort of like it and you want to try it again, and it's at the right price, then you'll buy the second one. So in a lot of what we do in booze, we had this other sort of mantra that was a little too, or not, a little too specific for this today, but we actually built a lot of our marketing and sales plan around selling the second bottle. Because again, the first bottle's easy. Right? Say you're from Butte, say you make booze, right there. That's going to sell, that's going to sell your first bottle. If nothing else, just walk up to the guy and say, I'm from Butte, buy my bottle. You know, and they'll be like, okay, I'm sorry. And they'll buy your bottle. But once you leave, they might not buy it again. 
And so a little bit of what we did was, um, I do believe that the product we're putting in the volatiles is relatively high quality. We think that, you know, we've won some awards. Our bourbon this last year, it tied for the best bourbon in America with one other brand called Angel's Envy. The Orphan Girl, the bourbon cream liqueur, there's only one other product like it in the market. And it's sold down in Kentucky. You really can't get there's It is sold in Montana. You can get a bottle of it here, but I'm not going to tell you what it is. I don't want you to buy it. But, um, and it's not as good. To be very brutally honest, it's not as good. We beat them in competitions as well. But we have something there that I think is relatively unique. When we go into a market with, with Orphan Girl, Bailey's stops selling. This isn't apocryphal. This really happens. There is still a liquor store in Butte that has the same case of Bailey's they ordered 16 months ago when we came out on the shelf and our product came out next to it. It stopped selling that day and they've never been able to sell the rest of it. So something is unique about the Orphan Girl and there's, and we have played that. It is our, it is our fat tire, it is our moose drill. I mean, I was, I was playing rugby here with Bjorn in 93 when he started Big Sky. In fact, if you ever go down to Big Sky and you see Bjorn, ask him about Johnny White Shoes. I was Johnny White Shoes. <laughs> so, and he'll tell you all about Johnny White Shoes. But um, he's also one of basically my, my advisors. As once we figured out what was happening with Orphan Girl, I went to him and I said, I think we've got a moose drill going on. And he said, okay, explain it. And I told him what was happening. He said, yeah, you've got a moose drill going on. What the hell are you going to do? And I said, I don't know. And so I still use him all the time to sort of help me craft what we've got going forward. Um, dear friend of ours is the lead brewer at New Belgium. He hates making fat tire. Right? He loves the product, but he hates making it. They've got 75,000 gallon fermenters down there. Okay? Half of them are just fat tire. Now, you know New Belgium makes a lot of other products, right? Can you really name more than two? Maybe three? If you, I can see you shaking your head. It's so good for you. I'm proud of you. But they have 17 products, man. You can't name them all. Um, I've got 12 of them in my fridge at home. I can't name them all. Um, <laughs> But they've got this core brand. And I think you get, that's a very unique thing in the industry when you've got something that grows and expands and sort of blows up on its own for whatever reason. And as part of that question you were asking me before, how do we do, what could we have done differently in planning? It is what happens if a brand takes off? How do you meet that capacity? How do you make sure your customers get what you want? So back to the Butte America part, we, I actually sat down with our marketing firm, oh, it was six months, seven months ago now, and this really became apparent to us. Like, it wasn't a flash in the pan. You know, Orphan Girl hadn't gone like this in sales and then dropped back off. It just kept going, going, going. And we sat down with them and we said, well, this is sort of funny. Because last night, we sat the kids down. This movie's not as good as I remember. But we sat the kids down, and they loved it. But Smokey and the Bandit. I don't even remember what Smokey and the Bandit, the movie was about. If you've ever seen it, Burt Reynolds, freaking awesome. Danny, uh, Dom DeLuise. Freaking awful movie, awesome movie, awful, it depends. Anyway, the whole purpose of that movie is they were smuggling Coors east of the Mississippi because up until the early 80s, you couldn't get Coors east of the Mississippi. So they were smuggling Coors. And so he was the, the bandit out in front of the truck trying to keep the Smokey, the cop, from finding the truck so they could get the Coors to their eventual customer. That's what the whole movie's about. And what we're finding a lot with, or, with, our broad, with our brand line right now is sort of the same thing. If the people can't get it, they're finding a way to get it. They come to Butte, and we can only sell you two per person per day. We had a guy come in during the Folk Fest last summer. He drove in from Seattle, spent five days, and he came in, and he'd bring in people he met from the Folk Fest, <laughs> and he'd buy a case or two at a time. He's like, I'm buying theirs, too. And they're like, cool. And so we stamped them. They're not getting their bottles. And they're like, well, I guess we're not getting our bottles. They didn't get their bottles. But he came in and bought all this, put it in his trunk, and went home. After five days, he probably had 20 cases in his trunk. And he took them home because we've got this sort of weird grassroots kind of thing going on. He wasn't a butte rat, interestingly. Um, and butte rats are even worse about it, to be honest. But. Um, uh, but there is some sort of a groundswell happening around the brand, and I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that we really co-branded the history. We really took what was special. I mean, the, one of our gin, the Anselmo, that head frame, I grew up in the shadow of that head frame. I grew up playing on that before they reclaimed it as a Superfund site, before they reclaimed it. Now it's all grass and everything before I was playing with mercury and lead and whatever. Um, <laughs> but I grew up in that. So to me, it's, it's very personal. I know the place. I can touch it. I can feel it. I've been there. 
And I think a lot of Butte rats know that too, especially the expats that are out in the world. They know that and they really share that message. And so I think some of our marketing has been successful because when you think about Butte America, you're really thinking about something that means something to that core of people that were there or had family there or had grandparents who worked there. It's a big damn deal, and at least to all of us. And so it, it sort of works out in the world. Well, John, we have come to the end of our time, so maybe one. I'll keep going. Question. Like I said, we'll go to draft work, so buy me a beer, I'll keep talking. Leave so. if you need to, but. Well, it's it's really important. You, really you, and, you and your wife, Ellen, uh, can you speak a little bit about the importance of advisors? Oh, yeah. Um, Critical. Um, remember that story I was telling you about how we were shot down and the, the head of the SBA had to go in and get us turned back on? Um, you got to have people who are helping you craft what your message is. And he was there very early on. I mean, he was the one that eventually introduced us to the Ag Bank, too, interestingly. We've got six bar stools at the bar. I don't know if you noticed that. There's only six. And each one has a name tag on the back for someone special in our project. Mick Ringsack has one of those stools. His name is on the back of that stool. But our advisors, what, we, what you got to figure out very quickly is that you don't know everything you need to know. So you might be doing relatively well. You might be doing freaking awful. But regardless of either, you don't know what you need to know, or at least not all of it. And so yeah, we sat a board of advisors very early on. And Mick's one of them. Um, uh, Sarah Calhoun, Red Ant's Pants, she's one of them. Uh, but we sat some people that we, we recognize for their various strengths, be it entrepreneur, be it, um, be it business savvy, be it experience having done this before. Um, we sat a group of five, and they've been our advisors now for, um, the first big meeting was about a year ago now, which means we'd only been open for six months, uh, where we finally sat a, a core group of advisors. We had plenty of them before, but these are actually our board of advisors. And if you do that, and I highly recommend you do, but if you do that, you've got to open everything up. Okay, there is no show them a little bit. All right, when we sat our board of advisors down, they had access that day to all of our books, top to bottom. And one of the advisors happens to be our accountant as well. But they had access to the books. They got to ask some very straight and very difficult questions, and our job was to answer those. Now, they are a board of advisors. You can be a dumbass and not take their advice. If you do that, you won't need a board of advisors because you won't have a business. So that's really the big part about it is that I know how to make hooch. I know how to build stills. I generally think I know how to pick people that are, that are awesome to work for because I work for our employees. I think I do that OK. But there's a whole lot of other things I don't do well, and I know that. And so to your point, a board of advisors or just a group of advisors that are not your mom, they're not your dad, they're not your wife, they're not your girlfriend, not your boyfriend, they are literally people across some sort of subset that are going to help you think about the path forward. And usually I would suggest an accountant. I would suggest someone who owns a business, be it successful or not. But someone that owns a business that can give you some insight, someone on the on the business that financing and, and sort of uh, 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 growth side, so someone that's either worked SBA, SBDC, something like that. They know where the money is, how to access it, how to help you get there, and then just generally cool people after that. Okay, well, if we can wrap it up, just in interest of sticking to our time frame, if anybody is not already on our email list and would like to get notification of future speakers and events, we have a sign-up sheet over there next to the pizza table. Take pizza if there's still some over there with no way out. So sign up for our email list. That's how we communicate. And thank you. Please join me in thanking John and Keith for coming. You're very welcome. Thank you.